welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Kucha. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at welfare economics. Uh, in specific, we're going to be taking a look at the fundamental theorem of welfare economics, as well as arrows and possibility theorem. Now, both of these theorems are actually quite mathematically rigorous, quite mathematically involved to demonstrate, to show what they intend to show. Now, okay, that math side is way beyond the scope of what we're going to look at. So we're going to be taking a look at a kind of a simplified version of these. A lot of smoke and mirrors to kind of uh, highlight the conclusions made by each of these theorems. Uh, without the math, though, they kind of seem uh, to a degree perhaps weaker than they are. Uh, but I assure you that they are strong theorems altogether, although not without their criticisms. If you have not already watched the first video where we defined efficiency, Pareto optimal outcomes, Pareto improvements, and understood the basis of an Edgeworth box, I'd recommend you go back and take a look at those videos because the concepts covered in that past video is going to be required in order to be able to evaluate, in order to be able to understand this fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Okay. That being said, let's go jump over. Let's take a look at the basis of welfare economics. So the fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Well, where I wanna start off with this is by taking a look at the assumptions. Assumptions. And that is before we even get into what the theorem is stating and to what the conclusions are of it, I really want to make sure that we understand what the assumptions are that need to be satisfied beforehand, because end of the day, a theory is only as good as its assumptions. And in order to understand or in order to be able to apply the conclusions of the theorem, we need to know whether or not these assumptions actually hold. So let's go take a look at these assumptions and Let's start off with the first one, which is no market power. Now, what exactly does this mean? Now, okay, if you've taken intro to micro, that is Econ 103, introduction to microeconomics, you probably have a recollection as to what this is. But if not, don't worry, we got you covered. What we mean by this is that all of our economic agents, so that is both our consumers and our producers, we're gonna presume that they are small and they are homogenous. In a simple kind of way, this is seen as perfect competition. Perfect competition. In this scenario, what happens is that each consumer, each producer is so small and so tiny with respect to the greater market that they have no influence. They have no massive amount of power that they can influence the price or influence market conditions in their favor. This would be that scenario that we looked at in the last video where we just had Adam and Eve. They were both of the same size in the overall market. They both had the same level of negotiating power. No one was able to put any undue pressure on the other in order to get an outcome in their favor. So our first assumption that needs to be satisfied is exactly that, that all of our economic agents are relatively small. None of them have undue negotiating power. None of them have any undue power to influence market prices in their favor, of course. So first assumption that needs to be satisfied. Is it a heroic assumption? Well, depends on the market we're looking at. Some markets, ah, presence of market power is pr quite predominant. Other markets, however, uh, other markets do fit closer to this perfect competition idea, such that there really isn't much, if any, market power present. So it really is a market by market scenario that you would have to evaluate this assumption by. Okay, so that's our first one. What's our next assumption? Our next assumption is no externalities. Okay, again, if you've been through micro, this term might be familiar. If not, don't worry, we have you covered. What is an externality? An externality, well, an externality is an external, right? Externality, external cost or benefit. And let's talk about exactly what we mean by that. Let's say that you go and you have a cookie. Okay. 
If we presume that in this production process of making the cookie, all of the costs of production are accounted for. That is, there's nothing in producing a cookie where, hey, the, you know, Mr. Christie's cookies gets to do it kind of for free underneath the table and has other people kind of ethereally as society pay this cost. No, no, no. Every cost in making a cookie is accounted for. That means you as the consumer, in that price you pay for the cookie, you bear the entire cost of the cookie. So in that sense there, we would say that your private cost, uh, your private cost, because you're paying for the cookie, you're paying for that entire production process, is going to be one and the same as the social cost. And two reasons for this. A, you as that private individual are part of society. So, okay, your private cost is social uh, society's cost because, yeah, your cost is also society's costs. Uh, above and beyond that, you already paid for that full price of the cookie that accounted for all of the costs of production. And we'll also presume that by you eating a cookie, you're not inconveniencing anybody, you're not incurring or you're not giving any extra costs to anybody else, right? So you also bear all of those costs individually. In the same sense, what we would have is that in you eating this cookie, your private benefit, so hey, all of that utility, all of that joy, all that satisfaction that you get from that cookie, well, that's all reaped by you and you alone. Nobody else gets some weird extra joy from watching you eat a cookie. So in that case there, your private benefit all that benefit, all that joy that you get is once again, all of society's benefit. So we have, in this case of you eating a cookie, the private cost equal to social cost, the private benefit equal to the social benefit. If this were the case, we'd be happy. We'd be fine. There'd be no problem. That is assumption two would be satisfied. We'd be good. But what happens if this isn't true? What happens if we do have external costs or benefits? Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the cost side because that's usually where it's more problematic. And we're gonna take a look at two sides of this cost side. On the one side, we're gonna take a look at a production or rather a negative production externality. And on the other side, we're gonna be taking a look at a negative consumption externality. So let's take a look at each of these. Uh, let's go and say that we have some factory, right? So here we go. Here's our factory. And in this production process, as unfortunately is the legal framework, is that to a degree, they're allowed to pollute, right? Given legal precedent, the firm has the right to pollute more than everybody else in society. There we go. This is everybody else in society more than they have the right to for, uh, clean air or clean water. Now, I say to a degree because there are still environmental standards, but there is a level of pollution that as a society, we just allow these firms to engage in. Now, in this sense here, as you go and you, I'll well, put you over here, you're still part of society, but a little bit more separate. As you go and buy this good, uh, what good is this going to be? Let's say this is an automobile, a vehicle. You just went and you bought a vehicle. Yeah, you got a new car. Okay, as you went and bought this car, you of course paid money to the firm. Now this money covered lots of the costs of production. It covered the cost of labor, it covered the cost of capital, it covered the cost of all the raw inputs. It also paid for the profit of the firm, right? So that was the return to the owners of the firm altogether. So most of these costs were covered. That's great, that's awesome altogether. The problem, however, is that what your, what your money did not account for was all of this extra pollution cost. And that is given current environmental standards, like we said, to a degree, the firm has the right to pollute. And this pollution, the cost of this pollution is not priced into the vehicle. So now what we have is we have your private cost, right? This was your private cost of buying the vehicle and it does not encompass the entire cost of that vehicle. That is, 
this pollution cost. Well, this pollution cost is then causing damage, causing trouble to certain members of society or society on large. And so as a result, we have a social cost that is over here that is above and beyond your own private cost. So altogether, society's cost for this vehicle is going to be, well, your private cost that you paid for, plus all of this extra cost that is incurred by everybody else. So that is, we'd say it's your private cost plus the external cost, that's our pollution cost, giving us this larger social cost. This is a problem. This is a problem because this is a part of the production process, a part of the cost that is borne by society, which we don't pay for. As a result, because we don't pay for it, everybody faces the burden of it, nobody pays for it directly, and it spirals out of control. We see this today in the world around us, and we see this with the environment and climate change, and predominantly being led because we just don't pay for the true cost of production. This is problematic. This is problematic, and again, this is an example of a negative production externality. And that's because this negative cost comes from the production of the good. Uh, mind you, then driving this automobile would also have a negative consumption externality and the fact that as you then consume the vehicle and utilize it, you have your exhaust and all of that, which then has its own costs. But let's kind of change the page up a little bit and let's talk about a different negative consumption externality. Okay, for this negative consumption externality, let's say that we have Joe. Okay. There's Joe. And Joe is out in a field, in a park, and around Joe, there's everybody else here in society. Maybe they're a bunch of friends, maybe they're just some passerbyers. They're all around, but hey, they're all in the vicinity of Joe. Now, Joe decides that he's going to light up and have a smoke. Now, okay, in this case here, Joe paid for the cost of the cigarettes and We'll presume that that cost of the cigarettes incorporates all of the costs of production. So that is, there's no production externality taking place. Joe incurred that entire cost by purchasing the cigarettes. Additionally, Joe is going to obtain the benefits of smoking the cigarettes, right? Believe it or not, there is some benefit in that. That's why people engage in the activity, right? So Joe's there and he decides to light up and he decides to smoke. We'll put the uh, there we go. And Joe is smoking. In this case here, though, what we have is a negative, a negative consumption externality. In this case, Joe paid the cost of the cigarettes. Joe is getting the benefit of the cigarette. And he is also incurring the cost that comes with cancer. And as an informed consumer, he recognizes that and determines, hey, you know what? The benefit is better than the cost. His decision. Problem is, everybody else over in society here, we can say we have Jill, uh, we have Jane, and we have George. Well, all of these people, they did not necessarily agree to incur this cost. Yet, by being around Joe, they are now subjected to Joe's secondhand smoke. So as a result, what we have is we have the private cost which Joe is happy with. Joe was happy with the cost that he was going to incur by smoking, but we have this extra external cost, right? Just like we had with the pollution side and the production point. In this case, we have pollution due to the consumption of this good. And so this private cost plus an external cost, this is going to give us all together our social cost such that once again, our private cost does not equal our social cost. That is, society has to bear the burden of the secondhand smoke, and they didn't want to do so. Any case that we have an externality like this, we are gonna witness a situation such that our social cost is going to be greater than our private cost, and that is society, ethereally as a whole, has to really come up with the come up with the resources, face the burden 
due to the private individual's actions. As a result, from a social perspective, in the case of a negative externality, whether it be production or consumption, from a social perspective, we would want less of this good or service to be produced or consumed on the other side of things, right? That is, we just want less of it to exist altogether. We'd want to recognize that, yes, there is a private benefit to it, and the private individual does get benefit for it, but it's polluting society. It has a higher social cost, and thus we need to account for that social cost in this good, and we'd need to price it in accordingly. Without getting into too much as to how we would correct externalities, really the point that we're trying to make here is that externalities do exist, and we're trying to give two demonstrations of a potential externality. That is the pollution from a production externality, or very similarly, the, uh, the pollution from a consumption externality. There are, of course, positive externalities as well. Education, um, pest control, all of these are positive externalities that take place. Um, we won't really take a look at them. If you want to, feel free to look them up. Um, really, the whole idea of this was just to highlight what an externality is, and that well, clearly they do exist in the world around us. Our third assumption for the fundamental theorem of welfare economics is that all goods are private goods. Now, okay, what, what does that mean? What is a private good? Well, a private good is a good that is both rivalrous and excludable. And that might not mean anything to you on its own. That is excludable. So what do these words mean? Well, for rivalrous, what this means is that if I consume the good, I get all the benefit of that good. So going back to the example we looked at a little while ago, if I eat a cookie, I get all the benefit of that cookie. There's no extra benefit being obtained by anybody else. So in this case here, if you wanted the benefit from that cookie, you and I, well, it's going to be a rivalrous relationship. We both want that cookie. We both want the benefit from it, but only one of us can get it. And so we're going to have a rivalry to decide who gets that cookie, who gets that benefit. The excludability side of things, excludability comes down to how easily you can prevent me from getting that benefit if I do not pay the cost, if I do not pay the price for it. In the case of most goods that we think about, cookies for example, it's quite easy. We put in checkouts, we put in security systems, and all of it is quite easy and quite trivial to prevent people from getting cookies without first paying the cost, without first paying the price to obtain it. So private goods by far and large are most of the goods around us that we think about, and they are both rivalrous. Only one person can get the benefit from this product, from this good, from this service at a time, and they are excludable, meaning it's very easy to prevent somebody from getting the benefit if they did not first buy it. However, not all goods are rivalrous and excludable. The goods that are not rivalrous or not excludable, we jointly refer to these goods as public goods. However, we have our subclassifications of them. Again, if you have gone through micro, this has all been covered. Don't get too caught up about it, though. We're not going into detail on this. We just want to present the idea that these other goods exist. So let's talk about what these other goods are, and let's see kind of where they fall, and just a brief idea as to the problems that arise with them. So based off of that, let's take a look at whether a good is excludable excludable versus non-excludable and rivalrous versus non-rival. And then by doing so, what we get is a fun little matrix here such that we can throw in what happens at the intersection of each of these of each of these kind of rivalrous or excludable points. Now the first bit, up in the top left, rival and excludable, these are our private goods. So these are the goods that we have no problems with. These are our cookies, so to say. 
but that doesn't mean that all goods are cookies, right? We do have certain goods that are going to fall into one of these other three categories. Again, collectively, we will refer to these other three categories as public goods. However, they are each going to have their own relevant name. Starting off with the top right, what we're going to have is a situation where the good is rival, but it's non-excludable. What exactly does that mean? Well, it means that if I go and I get that good, I get all the benefit, I can prevent you from getting the benefit, and it's extremely difficult, if it's even possible, to prevent me from accessing this good without paying for it. In this good, or in this good, sorry, in this case, what we have is what would be referred to as common resources. And for example, uh, common resources, these are most of our natural resources. Uh, we could take a look at an example uh, fitting for here in BC, our forestry industry. In forestry, if I go and I cut down a tree, I get that tree. I can burn that tree for heat for a fire. I can then harvest that tree for lumber and I get all the benefit of doing so. You don't also get that tree. So in that case there, this good would be rival. However, given the vastness of the outback here of BC or of Canada as whole, these goods are by far and large non-excludable. That is, it's extremely difficult to prevent me from going into the woods and cutting down a tree. Yes, we have our laws. Yes, we have our conservation officers that go to try to uphold this. But if me as one individual, not on a commercial scale, just as an individual scale, went to go into the woods to go and harvest a single tree, you'd have a really hard time catching me doing so. So as a result, this is a non-excludable good in this scenario. Problem in this case, what ends up arising? We tend to overutilize it. Every individual goes and realizes, hey, I get benefits from trees. I don't have to pay to harvest a tree. I'm going to go harvest another one. I'm going to go harvest another one. And we keep doing this because if I don't harvest it, somebody else will. And as a result, we harvest, we harvest, we harvest until the point of collapse. We over harvest, we over utilize, and we see a complete decimation of this common resource, this natural resource. This is what is often referred to as our tragedy of the commons. We see this in Atlantic Canada with the collapse of the fisheries. We see this in Atlantic Canada with the collapse of the forestry industry out there. Again, the rationale, the reason as to why I point to Atlantic Canada for this isn't because of bad modern management, but due to bad historical management. In the early colonial days of Canada, it was the early settlers showing up without central government, without the role of government to kind of police and manage these resources. And as a result, private individuals exhausted them, exhausted the fisheries, exhausted the forests. Thus the problem. Carrying on then, what do we have in the other corner? Uh, let's go to the bottom left there. So goods that are excludable, that is, it's really easy to make people pay but goods that are non-rival. So being non-rival means that I can enjoy the good at the same time that you can. What's, uh, what's happening here? Well, these kind of goods, these would be, if we gave them that subcategory name, we'd call them a club good. And some examples of these would be roads. Alternatively, it would be museums. Uh, we can also throw in libraries, swimming pools, these kind of situations. These are all club goods. And that is, they're all very easy to exclude for a road. It's very easy to put up a toll booth to say, hey, sorry, you can't drive on this road unless you first pay the toll. But if I'm driving on the road, it doesn't mean no one else can, right? We can have lots of people driving on the same stretch of highway up until a capacity, of course, right? Some some point we get congested, but up until that point of congestion, it's a non-rival good. Problem with these non-rival goods is that if they're not congested, there's no cost to society. If there's no cost to society, they should be free. Okay, if they're free, uh, no private enterprise is going to want to offer them. Right? No private enterprise is going to want to build roads, museums, libraries, swimming pools, etc. if they're going to charge them accordingly 
for free. Flip side of it is that if they become congested, so if they're no longer non-rival and they become rival, well, now there is a social cost. That is, if me now being on that road prevents you from being on the road, I am incurring, I am putting a social cost onto you. Now there should be a price accordingly. So problem is with these kind of goods is that if we leave them to the public or sorry, if we leave them to the private sector, they will tend to be underprovided. They'll be provided so that they're always congested so that they can always have a price attached to them. If we provide them publicly, well, then we're going to provide them publicly. We're going to provide them for free or at a cost recovery kind of method. But that's not always going to be efficient either, because even if we're providing them for free, there's going to be times, and I'm looking at roads here, where they become congested and we should charge a price. So problem with club goods is they kind of flip back and forth between whether or not they should be freely provided to society or whether or not they should actually have a price attached to them in order to be efficiently distributed. So again, don't want to get too much more into that. The idea here is just they exist and they create problems for our fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Final case. Okay, final case is public goods. And wait, didn't we refer to all of these as public goods? Yeah, yeah, we did actually. Everything but private goods, we said, hey, these three, these three collectively, we're going to refer to as public goods. The final one, though, the final one is just a public good on its own. And in this case, we have goods that are both non rival and non excludable. So this is a case where it's very difficult to prevent me from enjoying it if I didn't pay for it. And it's very difficult to, well, rather, Many people can all enjoy it at the same time. Some examples of this. Uh, one great example of this is our natural parks. Or, sorry, not natural. Let's try that again. National parks. Or our provincial parks or our municipal parks. Our provincial, provincial, municipal, regional parks. That's the word I was looking for, sorry. Uh, here on the South Island, we have lots of regional parks that exist as well. In all of these cases, right, if we think about in downtown Victoria, Beacon Hill Park, well, we get benefit from this park even just knowing it exists. That is, even if they put a wall around it and said, nope, you cannot enter Beacon Hill Park unless you pay, just knowing there's that green space, just being able to walk by and see the big trees, you're going to get a level of benefit from that. So even if you tried to put up a wall, it's still going to be non-excludable to a point. So, okay, that's the non-excludable side. You get the benefit from it without paying for it. The non-rivalrous side, well, hey, just because there's a park there and I can walk by and enjoy it, doesn't mean that by me walking by and enjoying it, you can't. Everybody can walk by that park and enjoy it at the same time, as long as it doesn't get congested, and we can all enjoy that national park, that regional park, et cetera, et cetera. What's the problem with these? Well, the problem with them is because they're non-excludable, that is, I get to enjoy it if I didn't pay for it, and it's non-rival, we can all enjoy it, it tends to suffer from our free rider problem. And that is, we all say, yes, a park would be great, but how about the other guy pays for it, right? That is, if we were asking for donations to build a park, we would all say, yeah, I would love a park, but I don't really have much money to give. And the reason you'd say you don't have much money to give is if any money to give is because you hope that other people do. And by other people paying for the park, you get the benefit without having to pay for it or with only paying for it minimally. So as a result, everybody tends to free ride on this. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody else will pay for it. And as a result, these kind of goods are either under provided or not provided in a free market. That is, they wouldn't exist if the government just didn't do it for us. And this is honestly in all of these public goods, that is all of these public goods, one of our rationales for having government is to step in and overcome the problems that we saw here. But what we're talking about right now is our fundamental theorem of welfare economics. And our big assumption here is that all goods are private goods. 
So that is, we're going to wave our hands and we're going to say these public goods in the yellow, they don't exist. Okay, so we've done a rather long-winded approach here. We've taken a look at a whole bunch of assumptions and we've gone into quite a bit of detail about these assumptions. So let's just kind of refresh ourselves as to what exactly is happening here. We've taken a look at these assumptions and what they were is our first assumption that there is no market power. And we talked about what that meant. We then said our second assumption was that there are no externalities. And we talked about what that meant. And then finally, our third assumption was that all goods are private goods. Or to put that the other way, to kind of keep the same theme of no market power, no externalities, it'd be no public goods. So either all goods are private goods or there's no public goods. If these three assumptions are satisfied, if these three assumptions are met for a given market, well, then our fundamental theorem of welfare economics will stand. It will be upheld. So what is it? Well, let's go take a look. Our fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Two parts. First fundamental theorem of welfare economics is that a complete market in equilibrium will be Pareto optimal. That is, if we were just to let it be, if we were just to leave markets alone, they would on their own be Pareto optimal. This would be like going back when we were looking at these Edgeworth boxes. Hey, we have an initial distribution of resources. All of our economic agents would figure out amongst ourselves a way to have Pareto improvements to obtain a Pareto optimal outcome. This year, this is synonymous with Adam Smith's The Invisible Hand. Right? There is no planner. There is no anybody overseeing it. It is just as if an invisible hand is guiding us towards this optimal outcome. So Adam Smith's invisible hand is kind of our synonym to be attached with this first uh, first theorem of welfare economics. It's also a big uh, a big kind of way that uh, not a big kind of way a big argument that is used in order to uphold this kind of idea of laissez faire economics, and that is this whole notion of let it be hands off, let the economy do its own thing because a free market is the best market. And if we go and we intervene, well, then we're going to just interfere with this Pareto optimal outcome. And so that is, if we just left it alone, it would achieve Pareto optimality on its own. And you can't get any better than Pareto optimality, right? That's the definition of Pareto efficiency, is that, hey, you cannot get anywhere else without hurting somebody else. So. First fundamental theorem, leave it alone. It will be Pareto optimal. What's our second part? Second fundamental theorem is that a Pareto efficient outcome can be supported by any free distribution. And again, we saw this with our Edgeworth box when we were looking at Adam and Eve with their apples and oranges. We changed the pre-distribution, right? That initial distribution is where we started off. And by doing so, we changed their initial indifference curves and we could get to a new Pareto optimal efficient outcome. So that is wherever we set that pre-distribution, we will then get some Pareto optimal outcome. What exactly does this mean? Well, it means that, hey, if we rechange the initial distribution if we could change the pre-distribution we can change the outcome of the market keep in mind that this change <laughs> with respect to the initial one it may not be actually it most likely will not be a pareto improvement a pareto improvement Right, and that is likely if we change that pre-distribution, that initial share of resources, likely one of the agents is gonna be made worse off. What it might allow though, what it might allow is a potential Pareto improvement. And this is, this is, a, this is a new bit. What, what exactly do we mean by potential Pareto improvement? What a potential Pareto improvement is, is where we've changed a 
in this case, let's talk about a change in the pre-distribution and such that let's say that Eve, Eve Winch, she gets like plus 25 utility altogether. So she's doing much better off. However, Adam, Adam is hurt by this, right? We have to change the pre-distribution. We were at a Pareto efficient outcome, a Pareto optimal outcome. So, hey, moving away from it is going to be bad. It's going to be hurting somebody. By changing this pre-distribution, we'll say that Adam loses 10. Okay. So, hey, Adam lost. Clearly, this cannot be a Pareto improvement because we've made a change and somebody's been worse off as a result. However, what it is, is it is still a potential Pareto improvement because given this, we have the potential for Eve to subsidize Adam's losses, right? For Eve to give 10 of her satisfaction to Adam such that Adam's no worse off. And in this case, we're talking about utility. Maybe that makes it a little bit unclear, a little bit abstract as to how we deal with this. Let's say that Eve makes $25 off of it and Adam loses $10. Well, in this case, Eve could compensate Adam for his loss. Eve could give Adam $10 so that Adam is no worse off. But as a society, we would still be better off. Eve would still be plus 15 altogether. So in this case here, we would have the potential to have a Pareto improvement. One of the big takeaways with a potential improvement Pareto improvement is that this transfer, this compensation does not actually need to take place. It's just whether or not that compensation could take place. And that's that's a big part with this definition here, is that we can have potential Pareto improvements that can have serious losses to certain segments of society. And as long as the winners could could compensate, well, it would still be a potential Pareto improvement, even if they don't compensate. Again, whether or not they do or don't, that's a policy decision. That's that side of things. Okay. With this whole bit here, where do we go with this? What is the big takeaways for us for this course? Um, we don't need to know all the ins and outs of welfare economics or rather the fundamental theorem of welfare economics, but what is what is the outcomes that are we interested in? Okay, first one. First one comes from that first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, and is essentially that, hey, if our assumptions are satisfied, they're rather heroic assumptions for some markets, but let's just pretend they're satisfied. If these assumptions are satisfied, there is no way to improve outcomes of any one agent without hurting another. That is, hey, if all of our assumptions are satisfied, we have Pareto efficiency. And as a result, we should just leave it alone. There is no way to improve social welfare. That is the takeaway from our first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. Second, what's our second? Well, our second is that if, if an alternative, uh, I'm just going to abbreviate there, distribution is socially desirable, this may be achieved. Okay. Let's uh, talk through that again so you can read through my chicken scratch. If an alternative distribution is socially desirable, this alternative distribution may be achieved. And the way that we can do it is by updating the pre-distribution. Big thing to keep in mind though is that this fundamental theorem of welfare economics, it ignores potential distortions that changes in pre-distribution might have. This here, by the way, is one of the big arguments to be made for kind of our intergenerational wealth taxes, our inheritance taxes, all of these kind of situations. 
The idea being is to prevent the ability of wealth of resources to be passed from one generation to another to ensure that each generation gets to start the game from an equivalent playing field. That you don't have certain people with a better distribution than others. Everybody enters roughly from an equal playing field and thus can achieve a Pareto optimal outcome based off of that. At least that's the idea with updating this pre-distribution by taxing inheritances, taxing intergenerational wealth to prevent its transfer. Based off of these assumptions, what we can say to summarize, to finish off our discussion on the fundamental theorem of welfare economics, if all assumptions are met, that is, if we were to have this economic nirvana, the only role of government, the only reason why we would have government would be to change pre-distributions in order to achieve socially desirable goals. Okay, seems like a cool idea, right? The only role of government is to achieve this social desirability. What we're going to see, though, is uh, that's, that's potentially a problem in itself. Potentially, we won't be able to even figure out what is a socially desirable outcome, and we're going to have a hard time figuring out where to go. That's going to be in the next video, though, where we're going to take a look at another concept known as Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. And then from Arrow's Impossibility Theorem, we're going to wrap all this up, taking a look at this whole idea of welfare economics, increasing social welfare, and really bring it together to discuss the difficulties attached to it. If you do have any questions, though, about our fundamental theorem of welfare economics, please feel free to comment below please feel free to post on D2L. And of course, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks. Until next time.